Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to today. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the custodians of these lands, for many tens of thousands of years. And I think we in the disability sector share with our Indigenous brothers and sisters that all important struggle for inclusion. And I think that we should ally ourselves very closely with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in this space, that, that we in the disability community understand what it means to be on the margins, what it means to be excluded, what it means to be on the outside, and how important it is to maintain the rage and the struggle to be included. As Deb said, I'd like to share with you some research today. Now, at the University of Melbourne, in the space in which I work, we are very committed to research that has immediate and practical application in the field. We're not into theoretical navel-gazing. And we are very enthusiastic and very keen on taking our research and getting it out there so that people actually use it. And that's why I get very excited about days like today, because some of the things that I'm going to talk about this morning, briefly in this session, you're going to get a chance to explore some of those elements of the individual supported living project later this afternoon. Regrettably, I, I can't be here this afternoon for that part of the workshop because I've got another function I need to be at, looking at the all important question of the employment of people with disabilities. But what I want to do this morning is unpack some of the research, some of the findings, and for you this afternoon to take up those findings and to start to explore them and apply them in the lives of your families. Okay. A lot of what we do in this space is very much grounded in the human rights agenda. And a reminder that Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability talks about people living lives of full inclusion and participation in the community. And as part of that, one of those important rights is to choose their place of residence and where and with whom they live. And I think this comes out very much in some of the discussion that we've already had this morning. That a home is a place, there are bricks and mortar involved, and sometimes there's a challenge to find the right place in the right location at the right price. And that's part of the struggle. But a home is also about with whom we live and with whom we choose to live. And it's one of the most fundamental things for each and every one of us is to choose the people with whom we share the roof over our head. And it's really important for people as they grow up, as they start to develop independent lives, that they too get that same choice of where and with whom they share the roof over their head. So part of what we want to do with individualised supported living is to create that space for choice and self-determination, and particularly that choice and self-determination about where and with whom people live. I love my mother dearly. She's 90 now, lives in Tasmania, and I, I keep in contact with her as much as I can by phone, and I, I see her a couple of times a year. But, and I'm sure my mum would understand this, I don't want to live with my mum at this phase in my life. I love her dearly, I keep in contact, I catch up regularly, but she's not the person with whom I wish to live under the same roof at the moment. We have separate lives in that respect. And I dare say this is the case for many, if not all here in the room, and indeed many of the people that you're thinking about. But this notion of living individualised lives of choice and self-determination is something that is very much grounded in the principles and the basis of our National Disability Insurance Scheme. 
And that scheme there is there to enable people to live self-determined lives, lives of choice. Of which where and with whom they live is part of that agenda. And the NDIS provides us with an incredible opportunity to realise these ambitions of choice and self-determination. Provides us with resources and enablers on that journey. And one of the things that it's so important is to work with your friends, work with your colleagues, work with organisations like Belonging Matters to navigate that system and to get the best out of that system for you and your family. And what I'd like to suggest is our individual supported living framework that I'm going to talk about today is one framework that you might use when navigating the NDIS, when seeking to get the best out of this system for you, your family and your loved one. So, what's this thing called individualised supported living? And my, my dear colleague, Professor Errol Cox, who led this project, says that sometimes it's easier to understand what something is by best understanding what it is not. And out of this project, we came up with some very clear understanding that individualised supported living is not living with your parents in the family home, no matter how much you love them that it's not living in an institutional setting. And we use the word institutional here, not just to reflect on large scale institutions of the past. And I did my original training in a 500 bed institution called Willow Court Centre in Tasmania, which was until its closure, the oldest institution in the country. But we also use this word institutional to refer to many situations that sometimes are called group homes. And sometimes, for some people, a group home can provide a home. But for many, the experience of group home living is institutionalised. And again, there is another tension there. And many of you here today are looking for those alternatives. The alternatives to group home living, congregate care, places where people are placed, not of their choosing, and are living lives with people not of their choosing. I would suggest that many of you are here today to look for opportunities, places and spaces where your loved one can live a life of their choosing with whom they choose. We've seen that individualised living arrangements can involve people living on their own, but not necessarily. Individual supported living can be involve living with a partner or a friend, living with a sibling, living with housemates, but importantly, living a life where you have chosen to live it and with whom you have chosen to live that life. In our project, we worked with 130 people across Western Australia, New South Wales and here in Victoria. And what became very clear was that individual supported living is not about independent living. And it doesn't presuppose that people have to live independently. Importantly, the question that I want you to sit with today is, is there any one of us who truly lives an independent life? Rather, the typical everyday human experience is one of living lives of inter dependence. And what we found, what we discovered, was that there was an incredible language, an incredible expectation, a whole lot of systems speak, that
that emphasised people living independent lives and people were subject to assessments of their degrees of independence. And there was all this talk about independent living. And indeed, sometimes people confuse the ISL concept, and I've got to be very careful not to confuse it with the ILC concept, but people kept saying, oh, that's about independent supported living. It's not. It's about individual supported living, which encompasses a full spectrum of interdependence. So when you're thinking about where your family and your family's future is unfolding and where the life of your loved one is unfolding, don't think about will they ever be independent of me? Will they ever be independent of su the support system? Are they ready to be given, offered independence? I want you to expunge the word independence from your minds today, from here on in. Because if you're thinking in terms of independence, this is a barrier that none of you in this room will overcome. I want you to assess your family circumstances, assess your loved one's support needs, assess and appraise and explore the opportunities with the concept of interdependence. And what needs to be in place to enable your loved one in your family to live a fulfilled, interdependent life? Interdependent with you as family, interdependent with a network of friends beyond the family, interdependent with the service system, but living an interdependent life. As Deb said, what we're talking about here is not opinion. This is not an opinion and perspectives piece from Keith McPhilly. This is evidence-based practice. What we have done in a very systematic way over a number of years is to explore with people their experiences and to examine the evidence base in order to come to what we're proposing today. The immediate findings of our project were from um, a, a project conducted over around about a three to four year period involving Curtin University, the University of Sydney and the University of Melbourne. And 17 other service provider organisations which hosted the project and which brought us into contact with 130 people across Australia with whom we shared some of their journey and the journey of their family. But this project actually stretches back and I, and I really do need to, to uh, acknowledge the very early and, and seminal work of Professor Errol Cox, uh, formerly from Victoria and uh, more recently at Curtin University in WA, who's been working on this for over 10 years now. We started from a number of assumptions though and that all people with the right supports can live in an individualised supported living arrangement. This is not about, oh, but my son's got really complex needs. Oh, my, my, my daughter's got major health concerns. Um, everybody with the right supports can benefit from an individual supported living arrangement. People do not need to live together, but people can live alone or interdependently. Just two, two examples here. Um, Sue has congenital rubella syndrome. She met her husband, Mike, at the day support service that they both attended. 
when Sue's grandfather passed away, he left some money to purchase a two-bedroom flat for Sue. Sue and Mike now live in the flat together. They get council support for cleaning and shopping. Mike is a good cook and cooks most nights and Sue and Mike visit Mike's parents every Sunday for lunch. This is just an example of two people living their lives. And if anybody had asked the question, are they ready yet? Their parents would have said no. Are they ready yet? Are they going to be independent? No, but they live interdependent lives. Interdependent on each other as a couple, interdependent with their families, and interdependent with the broader support system. Another example here. Joe is deaf. He's lived in an office of housing, uh, an office of housing flat for 10 years, and his family put his name on the waiting list when he, wa when he expressed an interest of moving out from home. There was lots of forward planning here. What you're thinking about today might not be what happens in your family next week or next month or next year. It might be that you're working towards something two, three, four or five years hence, but you need to start today. Joe works in supported employment and he receives eight hours of support a week to help with shopping, cleaning, paying the bills and the like. And he attends Deaf Club once a month and sometimes has a coffee with his neighbour an interdependent life. Another key finding that came out of our research was the importance of not just having a home, but what went with that home was a network of friends, services, and typically employment, or at least some regular vocational or avocational activity that the person went to each day or at least a couple of days of the week. It is necessary but insufficient to have a house or a home. You also need somewhere to go out in the community and that was a very important part of the planning. So what we did, we visited 130 people. We spent time in their home observing what was happening in the home and their local community. We spoke with family members and then we formally assessed what was going on. And I have got copies of these handouts if you can't read all of this, so I'll show you the process on those handouts later and Deb can make the slides available, okay? So, our teams, our evaluation team, spent a lot of time reflecting on the evidence and working up the tool that you're going to explore some of those themes that we developed from this process. Uh, and you're going to explore some of those themes this afternoon. And a big shout out to Teresa, who was one of the people on those teams and is very experienced with this process. So in leaving after morning tea, I leave you in safe hands that Teresa knows what she's talking about. Okay. For just a bit of background for some of the people, where had they been? They had lived at home, they had lived in some other form of individualised supported living, some of them had moved out of group homes uh, and some of them had lived in, in other arrangements including large scale institutions. Interestingly enough for most if not all of the people that we visited and spent time with, where they were now was typically their second, third or fourth attempt at a home. And the typical pattern was people moved out of home, moved out of a group home, had a go somewhere, it didn't always work out, maybe they moved home, they had another go. Don't expect it to land perfectly first time, don't be stressed if it doesn't work perfectly the first time. Most of the people in our project had had several goes at making this happen before they landed in a space which was comfortable and for them. And is that about having a disability? Or is that most of our experience and indeed the experience of, of most young people today? I'm already talking with my son, eight years of age, about where he's going to live in the future. 
and he's very keen on the fact that he's staying with mummy and daddy. <sighs> Time never too early to start planning. Anyway, where were people living? Well, some of the people in our project were living alone. Many had a co-residency, maybe with a friend, maybe with a friend who also had a disability, but also maybe with a in a relationship with a partner maybe with a host family, and we certainly found people who were sharing their home with a person who didn't have a disability, but with whom they had a, an arrangement of mutual support. And that might have been a student or that might have been another uh, young person, similar in age, who also lived in the house with them, offered a bit of support, but they and the person also had independent lives, but they lived in the individualised arrangement in an interdependent way. Okay. So there is no one way of doing this thing. There's a whole lot of variety. We found people had a whole different range of supports. Individualised supported living is not just for the person who has a, a physical disability but no cognitive impairment. Individualised supported living is not just for people with a borderline or mild intellectual disability. We visited people whose individual arrangements were structured around their support needs where they were at. And there were people who certainly had mild to moderate intellectual disability, some people with very complex healthcare support needs, and all had achieved an individual supported living arrangement. All people can experience an individual supported living arrangement if given the right support. And the right support starts with the people here in this room today. Um, I'll leave with the slides, there's just some of the facts and figures from the project and there is a project report on this, which I will leave the reference at the end. But certainly there was some ongoing and very tangible supports that families needed to commit to in the medium to longer term. And some of those families were playing it very smart and they were engaging with not just the disability workforce or community service provider agencies, but they were engaging with solicitors and accountants and setting up trust funds and putting in place fairly sophisticated financial arrangements to ensure the security of that arrangement going forward. So I would encourage you today and going forward not only to think about what can the NDIS offer and what can the social and community services sector offer, but to also explore what the finance and legal sector can offer in terms of putting a secure base in place for these arrangements. As I said, it was very important for people in these arrangements for them to be successful, not just to have bricks and mortar, not just to have a home in the right location, not just to have the right people sharing the roof with them, but also to have people outside of the home with whom they connected, and places and meaningful activity to go. And for many of the people in these individual supported living arrangements, some form of paid employment was a common feature. I'm not talking about 40 hours a week of, of hard slave labour, 80 hours if you work in a university. <laughs> but some people just had couple of half days or maybe one day a week of work, which gave them some meaningful activity, brought them into contact with some people outside their home and put a bit of cash in their pocket as well. Okay. The eight themes that came out, that we teased out and refined during this process through the interviews and the meetings and the reflection on what people were experiencing, what they told us about their lives in these individual arrangements. 
These eight themes are what you're going to talk about this afternoon, but just very briefly, the importance of leadership. And that leadership typically had two key people involved. The person with disability and often mum, okay? Often mum. Sometimes dad as well, but often mum. And it was being prepared to work together and to share leadership and to see across the time as maybe mum initiated this, mum and dad initiated this, maybe um, a brother or a sister exercised some leadership, but over time how this leadership was passed on to the person with a disability. And we saw some people in the very early stages where they were very much reliant on parents and siblings in that leadership role and some people in very well established situations who were leading the way themselves. And indeed, mum and dad had died and they were the leader in their own right, but only because mum and dad had set them up to succeed in the first place. Okay? It needed to be the person's home, decorated the way they wanted, set out the way they wanted, routines the way they wanted, really important. One person at a time, thinking about individuals. There was a lot of planning involved. It didn't just happen. And planning typically took months, if not years. And planning was ongoing. It wasn't just a decision, an action, and tick it off. Importantly, the person had control over the situation. It was their name on the tenancy. It was their name on the lease. It was their name on the bank account. Safeguards in place, smart lawyers involved sometimes, but the person was in control. There was support. They were set up for thriving. There was social inclusion beyond the home. That's what you're going to talk about this afternoon. To wrap up, the next steps in our project will be to develop the training resources that leverage these themes and what we have discovered through this project. We want to share those resources with organisations like Belonging Matters so that families and circles of support can use these processes to help in the planning of a way forward for individuals. But we also see that the use of the individualised supported living framework can also be applied as a framework to help in the evaluation of how things are going and when you're preparing for your annual review of your NDIS plan and to know what you need to ask for and to be able to provide the evidence that you need to justify the funding that needs to be in place. So we see this tool as having not just a theory of being of theoretical interest but of being a very practical value. There's a couple of publications around this and I'm happy if you want to contact me and Deb will circulate the information. So thank you very much. Thank you.